All right, welcome everyone. I am here with a very special guest, Crypto News Alerts, and we've got a lot to discuss on what has been one heck of a firework day. How are you, my friend? Doing fantastic. Bitcoin's pumping. We're on the cusp of reclaiming price discovery. I couldn't be any better right now, brother. Yeah, there's uh, obviously tons of stories and narratives that are forming after Bitcoin went as high as 63.7K just a few hours before this recording. What we're looking at right now is just the past seven days of returns, which obviously is showing here to be a sea of green. Bitcoin up 20.3% in the past week, Ethereum up 16.2%, uh, getting as high as about 3,400, now sitting at 3,338 itself. And then we just have plenty of major altcoins uh, that have been breaking out, Theta up 74%, and Pepe, the most notable gainer uh, of these top 100 market cap assets, up 188%. Uh, but to start it off, what do you think of this pump? Has it has it been kind of a shock to you and your community or is it uh, kind of par for the course? Part of the course, I've been preaching every day on my daily podcast that we're going to be inching closer and closer to price discovery leading into the halving. I'm a firm believer in that would ultimately take us to 70,000. I think we're ahead of schedule with still 51 days approximately until the halving schedule to take place mid-April. So we're right on track, and I'm now leaning towards Adam Back's uh, prediction of 100000 per Bitcoin within the next 51 days. I know it's possible. Yeah, as you're referencing, this is the tweet that he put up uh, a few hours ago. He said, a 100K by having day, people starting to believe, bears, levered short, wrecked, scared off, profit take, limit orders, moved upwards or just deleted to wait and see, OTC desks out of coins, daily, 500 million slash 10K BTC ETF buy walls. This can gap upwards fast. And uh, obviously, Adam has a, a very large following and he doesn't make these posts lightly. And when we refer when he references those ETFs, by the way, we can look at exactly how much volume has been going into them and even the inflows and outflows going on. And we've reported yesterday that we saw two record high days. Uh, 6.14 or 6.15 billion in USD volume on the 25th and 7.64 wow. billion dollars on the 26th. And today is looking like it's going to be shaping up to be uh, rivaling those numbers, we'll say, as we're about halfway through the trading day and it's all already at 4.3 billion. Yeah, I also heard the ETF inflows now collectively have over 300,000 Bitcoin. And just to understand, it took MicroStrategy, the first publicly traded company to put Bitcoin on the balance sheet. It took them four years to acquire what they have today, 193,000 Bitcoin on the balance sheet. So they just blew past MicroStrategy in like six weeks and we're just getting started. Yeah, that's absolutely nuts. Those are those are insane numbers. Uh, looking at some of the inflows and outflows, you can actually see by ETF which ones are showing um, inflows and outflows. And great uh, grayscale Bitcoin trust flow has actually been seeing expectedly more outflows. Uh, I, I'm very interested to see what happens with Fidelity and BlackRock, uh, but we'll probably re report more on exactly what those numbers look like per ETF here in the future. Um, I also wanted to touch on uh, some of the printing of stable coins that has been going on, beginning with this whale alert post from earlier this morning. It seemed like while we were asleep here in the US, 4 a.m. Pacific time, that's when we had a lot of news suddenly break out right before the surge to 63.7K. In this case, they reported $120 million in Tether were transferred from the Tether Treasury to Bitfinex. Uh, so when large amounts, especially nine-figure amounts of stablecoins suddenly move to exchanges, whether it's straight from the Treasury or from a, a huge whale, usually positive things happen. Uh, that's essentially buying power going onto an exchange for the purpose of purchasing crypto, which thus will pump, pump up prices. Uh, alternatively, if you see a bunch of Bitcoin moving to an exchange, that's usually bad news because you don't see that happening much unless there's an objective to sell. 
So in this case, that was a good foreshadowing sign that we were going to break right past 60K and perhaps well beyond, which is what ended up happening. We even saw USD coin minted at uh, the USDC treasury for an amount of $63.3 million approximately. So there's no shortage right now of stable coins and buying power. Uh, call it what you will, you know, printing out of thin air for the purpose of buying more crypto. I understand the, the critiques of people who, who kind of are wishy-washy on stable coins in general, but for now, this likely had a lot to do with prices pumping today. Exactly. And last night I did a 13 hour pump watch. I started at 11 p.m. here in Puerto Rico and the target was 60,000. And this morning I woke up, we smashed 60,000. I'm like, no way. This right. is so cool. I crashed last night. We were like, I don't know, 57.5. So it's been a heck of a run. And again, I think we're just getting started. We have too much demand with very little supply which is about to get chopped in half in 50 days so i mean basic stock to flow tells us numbers have to go up here yeah and the question always is <clears throat> kind of like what we saw with the etfs right back in early january as as we got closer and closer to the acceptance date which was to be fair unknown when the sec would accept the bitcoin etfs but it ended up happening in mid-January, early January, roughly when people were expecting. And leading up to that, prices were really inching up. We got past 35K and then 40K, and then the ETFs were accepted, and suddenly we saw this plummet. And the argument is always, are we, are we buying the rumor and selling the news again with this halving? It has been such a consistent upswing in the past four-year cycles <clears throat> that people see it as an inevitability that we just continue climbing, at least going up to the having. But at some point, there will be um, there will be some retrace, right? There always is, and we have to have to keep in mind that markets could very well get baked in with the new value of the having before the having actually occurs, right? Is that something that you've ever kind of explored and the phenomenon behind that? I absolutely think about that all the time. We discussed that in our live chat. I personally don't think the having is priced in. I think this is all a result of the massive ETF inflows we're witnessing in unprecedented numbers. Uh, BlackRock doing over a billion dollars a day in ETF inflows. You just showed a chart uh, over six billion coming in. Mm -hmm. um, it just launched a month and a half ago. I think the approval date was January 10th, the official date. And by January 11th, they launched, which is unheard of as well. Typically, it's like a 30 to 45 day period from the official announcement to the launch, but they didn't waste any time uh, whatsoever. So of course it could be a potential, yeah, it's all priced in, but I don't think nothing is priced in. I'm so bullish, Brian. I'm going to blow your mind. Like yeah. I'm extremely bullish right now. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's, that's what it's all about. Um, I, I think you are uh, based on the amount of news you follow and the podcasts you do and the 11 hours of pump watching, like you, you're definitely very connected to what the crowd is thinking. Uh, and maybe that's a good segue for us to look at uh, if I can find the right tab here. Yeah, let's take a look at just how the crowd is reacting as this pump happened. I, I love looking at this stuff. Uh, what we're looking at here are the overall mentions of the word buy or the word buying. We could even make it more specific while I think about it and put uh, buy Bitcoin. What we'll do is we'll put that in parentheses here and we'll put or buying Bitcoin and for good measure will include BTC also, just so we're covering all little combinations of words. There you go. So if I hit enter on this, give it a few seconds and boom, we see tons and tons of people talking about buy, buy Bitcoin or buying Bitcoin at this moment. Uh, the largest such spike since the ETF announcement day uh, when the SEC wow. approved 11 spot Bitcoin ETF. So Honestly, not a shocker there. I think that's to be expected because this is the most celebratory day um, with such a large 
psychological support level getting broken. Um, generally speaking, I, just as a forewarning, this might be a very short term caution, but when you see the crowd getting this level of FOMO, it's usually followed by a bit of a rest period. It could even be a, a bit of a retrace period. I don't expect a, a massive crash with the amount of positive fundamentals showing, but this does indicate that the crowd's meter, as far as bearish to bullish is going, is leaning much more bullish than usual, uh, particularly today. Yep, and that's why if you look at the Crypto Greed and Fear Index, we just hit the highest level I've seen in a couple of years. I think it just surpassed 80. Yeah, I, I'm not surprised by that either. Uh, their, their chart there is... I, I'm still, it's a bit of a mystery to me as to what their exact calculations are, but I know that it has some correlations. So we like to check in on their, their meter from time to time. But you can see, especially on Twitter here, I mean, just an explosion of FOMO, uh, a little bit on 4chan as well. But yeah, across the board on the platforms we follow, it appears that the FOMO is very present. And then if we look at the hourly trends too, like what's what's been discussed, obviously 60K was the big topic after it was breached earlier. We saw 58 and 59, so still remnants of topics from what people were talking about over the past 24 hours. It's funny how fast crypto moves. Pepe has been a big subject, obviously up, what was it, 180 plus percent in the past week. Um, and then the halving, look at that, how, how much people are suddenly talking about the halving as people look for something to attribute this pump to. And obviously the halving is likely a very correct uh, answer as to why we're seeing these kinds of surges. So lots you can explore on the social trends page for sure. Um, let's look at a few other topics while we're at it. Brian Armstrong talks about the large surge of traffic on Coinbase, no surprise there. Uh, from my understanding, there were some issues with Coinbase not working correctly that you, you and I were joking about before the call even started. This is kind of like um, uh, just the cyclical thing that happens when crypto markets start to go uh, crazy. Coinbase suddenly has technical issues. And that's alarming. Imagine waking up, you got a lot of Bitcoin or anything in your wallet and it just goes to zero. <laughs> I know. And there's yeah. no one to really contact with support. You know what I mean? So it's kind of scary there in that sense. It's terrifying. And I, I really am shocked that they don't have a better support system for stuff like that, considering the amount of money that's going in and out of Coinbase these days, especially after F ever since FTX collapsed about 16 months ago. But um yeah, so people are certainly concerned about that. I, I would imagine it's going to be a, very, a fairly minor deal. I'm just curious how big of a spike we saw in mentions of Coinbase. Oh, yeah, look at that massive, massive jump there. Wow. Yeah. So that's usually a, a sign of a bit of panic, um, mostly related to people's funds being safe, of course. Uh, we will say that Coinbase has not had a history of losing f mass funds the way some other exchanges have, and that's why it has the more positive reputation relative to others. Um, even CoinGecko, by the way. So this is interesting. Uh, CoinGecko, understandably, is getting a, an uptick in traffic as well when people are trying to figure out what to do next. And um, I read this as a sign that people are starting to look into altcoins right now. If they're going to a platform like CoinGecko or something related that covers thousands of different projects, it's it's natural where you see a pump to something like 63.7K and then the next step is profits get redistributed into other projects. So of course people are looking at altcoins at this moment. Um, we could even quantifiably see just how much by typing in Let's see if I can get the keyboard to work. There we go. Alt or alts or altcoin or altcoins. Let's see what pops up there. Yeah. So as expected, another huge spike. The social volume is at its highest. Honestly, this might be the biggest spike in a year. Not quite. Yeah, but either way, I mean, there's just... I know why. This was due to a Twitter API change. So it's... 
you can only really measure since mid-June, back when Mr. Musk here changed uh, the way that data could be read and got rid of a bunch of bots. So based on based on post API change, this is the largest, second largest spike since July 13th that we got in altcoin discussions. And when we did see that discussion spike, that actually ended up being a local top for what it's worth. So just a slight cautionary warning right there. Besides that, and I'd love to hear your, your take on this, we're seeing kind of lukewarm responses from sharks and whales at this time. What we're looking at here is the overall amount of supply uh, in percentage held by sharks and whales, specifically wallets with anywhere between 10, which are super small shark wallets, all the way up to 10,000, which are super large whale wallets. If you would go past 10,000, that's almost always exchange addresses, which is why we specifically choose this range. And the 10 to 10,000 range makes up about two thirds, almost exactly two thirds of the overall supply of Bitcoin. And you can see this dark green line is the absolute value um, when accounting for new coins coming in, uh, mining, stuff like that. So they're holding, as of right now, 13.07 million BTC, which looks pretty good, but it's not quite following this trajectory of the pump. We'll, of course, have to see what it looked like at the end of the day. Maybe they did have something to do with this pump and they accumulated really big. But as of now, you know, looking at looking at this, um, this is what the whales are doing and this is what the price is doing. We're hoping to see a little bit of catch up from sharks and whales, because if if they stay flat while prices move up, there's usually just not enough enough steam to sustain further and further rallies. Uh, and we saw ever since what looks like about a month ago, precisely a month ago, they really did accumulate big since January 28th. They're still up. They, they added a collective 92.6 K. BTC, uh, which is hundreds of millions of dollars, and I think that's actually billions of dollars. I won't do the, the math right now, but trust me, it's a massive amount. Um, and if they if they start to drop here, look out, right? We've seen it before, uh, where there's a huge price rally, everyone gets excited, and then they pull the rug, right? But what do you think is in terms of the shark and whale impact here right now? Do you do you have any thoughts on in terms of what they what they're going to do is it mostly due to ETF? Is it a combination of everything? Good data, by the way. So I appreciate you bringing up uh, this chart showing the cohorts of people with wallet sizes of ten Bitcoin uh, to ten thousand. It's interesting to see the price exceeding you know the whales and where they're at so it'll be interesting to see if the whales continue with that trend or if they do a pullback and there is a correction i'm not nostradamus so honestly yeah. i don't know what to expect short term i tell people expect extreme volatility especially leading into the having now that we're less than 60 days out expect extreme volatility coming out of the having post having as well but i think the overall trajectory will continue to climb as far as the price is concerned. Um, I do like to follow the smart money, which I consider uh, the whales as well. Typically, they have some insights what's going to happen into the market. So we'll keep a close eye on it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I think the, the shark and whale line looks completely fine here, right? It's certainly not dropping yet, but this is something we're going to monitor over the next 24 to 48 hours. What I do think is a little concerning is the fact that USD coin, the supply held by them, they were holding 38.2%. This is a, a slightly different range. We're looking at $100,000 wallets to $10 million wallets in terms of USD coin in blue and Tether in red. And so they were holding 38.2%. Now they're only holding 32.4%. So that's a, a pretty large drop. Uh, in, in addition, Tether is, is kind of looking the same way, going from 36.4% uh, of the supply down to 33.5%. So it's great that there's more Tether and USD coin being minted, 
great is, I guess, subjective, depending on how you want to look at the money being printed out of thin air, right? But um, I, I would be a little concerned by the lack of dry powder currently being held by sharks and whales. That could change in an instant, but that's been kind of the long-term trend since uh, mid-December, and that certainly hasn't stopped prices from exploding. I'd also want to mention that uh, the supply and exchanges here has been moving down very quickly. Uh, I see that as of right now, it's at its lowest point, 5.2%. This is the lowest point since 2017. Uh, so we're wow. actually starting to get close to the one of the lowest ratios of supply and exchanges of all time now, if it exceeds what we saw uh, back in 2017 when it was below 5%. Um, and the better news is for the stable coins, there is a large amount of the percentage of supply that's currently sitting on exchanges. So those who have the, that dry powder, they're putting it to use and they're they're bringing it to exchanges and they haven't converted a lot of it yet. There's still plenty that is in stablecoin form instead of turning into Bitcoin and then being moved off wallets. So, Wow, I so, couldn't imagine having all this stablecoins on the exchanges and missing out on this pump. So I bet you it's tempting to yeah, put I it agree. in Bitcoin right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder, you know, Coinbase does have something like a 5 to 5.5% 5 .5 APR thing with USD coin. So that probably does incentivize people a bit to leave something in, in USD coin if they're unsure about, you know, how far this Bitcoin rally can go. But I agree. I think people that have been keeping their stable coins as stable coins on exchanges of all places, um, they're kind of kicking themselves uh, watching prices just continue to make new records. Yeah, there's there's no worse feeling than having all this stable coin on the exchange, missing out on the pump, and they're probably praying to the gods, please correct so I can get in at a lower level, and that yeah. may never come. I think that's what a lot of people, those are kind of the, the narratives right now. For those who aren't all in or, or mostly in, it's because they're still bullish, but they want prices to come back to a range where they can feel good about buying. And then the other contingency of people are just all in and, and patting themselves on the back for being in during this rally. But I'm not seeing many people that are super bearish. There's still plenty of people out there, absolutely. But they are, they are by far the minority right now. Facts. And it's cool to see the supply shrinking. We haven't had this low of a supply available in the exchanges, you said, since 2017. I think it goes to show you we are going to witness a supply and a demand shock this year leading into the halving as the ETF inflows are sucking up all of the Bitcoin available right now at a factor of 10 to 15 X the daily issuance. And that's mm -hmm. about to get slashed in half, which is going to double the demand with the you know supply getting cut in half so definitely more bullishness yeah well said well said we can also see the percentage of discussions related to bitcoin versus altcoins which is a really cool stat so this is social dominance generally if it's over this 20 percent line meaning discussions related to bitcoin specifically make up at least a fifth of all of the token discussions that's generally a healthy thing for the markets I have seen when there's a big spike like this, like there is right now, these have traditionally led to local tops or led to markets kind of flattening out. So you can go back to late October. Uh, suddenly, Bitcoin is the topic of, um, so add 20% to this because this line adjusts for 20. So the top left bubble says 16. That would mean that 36, 37% of discussions are related to Bitcoin. Um, here, same thing, 37%. Here it goes all the way up to 50% of discussions. And that was a big local top. This was when the ETFs were announced. So, of course, everyone's talking about Bitcoin there. But you can see when there are big spikes, there are some retracements or the markets at least kind of chill out for a bit until people start talking about altcoins a bit more or Bitcoin a bit less, however you want to look at it. So I thought that was interesting as well. Um, Definitely good data. And probably the number one question I get people asking me, when are we going to pull back? And I got to remind people, define the pullback because the pullback may be what we just witnessed. We almost tapped 64. We're right back at 60. These seem to be the pullbacks when we're on a rip, kind of like how we are right now. So 
That's we'll a really theme. great point. Yeah, we have data that, that kind of answers that question too, because you know we all hear about the mantra of buying low and selling high and how you should just stick to that strategy. But in crypto, it's so hard to define what a high or a low is, right? Because it depends on the time frame you're looking at, how much you've zoomed out. And uh, according to MVRV, what this does is it, it doesn't just show how high the price is now to a year ago or whatever. This is looking specifically at short-term traders. In this case, this orange line is looking at the average returns of any address that has been active in the past 30 days. This teal line is showing the average returns for anyone that's been active in the past 365 days. So over time, it's hard to forget this or, or hard to remember this, I should say. Not not everyone in Bitcoin is just mutually working toward getting their respective Lambos. This is still a zero sum game at the end of the day. There are losers for, for every winner and winners for every, every loser. And because of that, this MVRV metric is cool because no matter what time frame you look at, it's going to fluctuate, fluctuate around 0% given enough time. So when it's way high like this, this is, this is great and, and reflects that people have been profiting and those who have been longing are rewarded for this kind of pump. But when you see the 30-day MVRV, for example, above around 15%, I can mark it right about there. So anything above there, you start to get into a bit of a danger zone. You saw when it crossed back two weeks ago on Valentine's Day, we, we chilled out for a bit. We didn't retrace, but we at least stopped. Uh, going back here, it goes above 15%, and oh, it suddenly chills out and retraces a bit. Uh, here it didn't retrace, but it, it at least flattened out. So I wouldn't be surprised if we at least have kind of a calming period. Um, I don't know if it's going to happen precisely at the 60 to 63K level. It could you know, bust all the way through that, that 68, 69K all-time high before it calms down. But there is some point in which the MVRVs typically get too high, and plus 21% for 30-day traders is very high, plus 65% for 365-day traders is extremely high. We only really saw one other instance of it getting this high in the past five years. And, and I hate to sound like I'm, I'm just giving a bunch of negative news. I, it's really just um, factoring in the risk. Like if you're trying to add on at this point or open a new position in Bitcoin because you see all these rallies, just understand that there are metrics that indicate that we're in kind of an anomaly period right now. Um, so if I look at just the 365 day, there we go. So we can see back in 2020 and June of 2019, uh, that's when we went above 60% before. And that ended up being a retrace here uh, when it got all the way up to plus 105%. And here, similarly, it got all the way up to 109%. And we actually managed to take a little bit higher and then retrace. So just keep in mind that long-term traders especially are really, really in the profit zone right now. And that means that there's a certain level of risk. Ah, I was I was hoping to show this model, but that's okay. Um, overall, it looks like most coins out there are in kind of that semi overbought to overbought range. But like we said, this is kind of uncharted territory. This is a new landscape with ETF volume and inflows um, assisting in price action without blockchain data showing up traditionally like it would here. So you got to take everything with a grain of salt right now. Um, I'm curious, do you track funding rate data at all? Does that factor in at all to your analysis? Sometimes we cover, I typically in my show, I just follow a few sources. Sansman's one of them, by the way, love your content, uh, like Cointelegraph and such. So we do cover like the funding rates here and there. I think that does affect uh, the markets, but I'm no expert in this field, so I'm all ears. Yeah, yeah. I mean, long story short on this, it essentially when you see a ton of longs like we did way back in March of and April of 2021, that's kind of a uh, a sign of greed and an indication that people are putting their money where their mouth is. So you see all the social talk about buying Bitcoin, 
but people lie all the time, right? They, they shill coins without actually doing so. This is them, this data is them backing it up and actually showing there's a lot of margin and leveraged longs going on right now. Um, right now, it's not in any extreme range, which is, is great news. Um, if it was way up high like this, that would be a sign that there's a lot of liquidations that could happen at any given time that could just shoot the prices back down. Um, alternatively, if you see a lot of red bars, that means there's more shorts than longs, and shorts are actually paying longs in order to be short. Um, but we're not seeing that at this moment. Right now, it's fairly flat. Uh, if we get a little more granular, just looking at the last three months, let's make that price a little bit smaller. Yeah, so we actually saw a pretty big amount of longs on the 27th, and it, this is kind of an anomaly, but it did not slow down prices, and we're starting to see a, a little bit of longing going on again. Um, again, it, it isn't at that extreme range that we saw back in 2021, but just keep in mind that if people are really opening up, opening up those leveraged longs, uh, that adds to the risk of a sudden correction, kind of like we saw on a minor level back at the beginning of this year, January 2nd. So right sure. on, because ideally the market maker wants to wreck everybody and right. collect. So it's in their best interest. So if we get any extreme to the one side, we can expect a little rebalancing, which makes makes sense. Yeah, that's exactly right. As Anytime the funding rates are moving in an extreme level in either direction, the market maker is trying to move it back toward neutral. That's that's pretty much what they're trying to do. Um, and that's that's just the natural occurrence of, of how markets work. Um, I should also mention whale transactions here. That's interesting to see. We've got on the 26th, there were 3,472 separate transactions that exceeded $1 million in value. That was the most we've seen in at least the last three months. I'm seeing how much, yeah, most in six months. Yeah, it, it, this was a, a one-year high that just happened on the 26th. So Good to know. Tons and tons of whale activity, that's for sure. Um, also, profit, profit action, as you would expect. So what this is doing is it's measuring the amount of transactions happening while that coin while those coins are in profit basically compared to whenever that wallet got those coins we have the data to see okay based on when it got the coins versus when they're being moved are those coins at a higher level or a lower level and as you would expect most transactions that are happening right now are happening while those coins are at a higher level than when the wallet got them that's why the ratio of transactions happening in profit versus loss on chain right now are through the roof. We're seeing about a six to one ratio of profit transactions versus loss transactions. Uh, and that's easily the highest we've seen in over a year. Um, typically on more of a long-term scale, like if I change this to seven days, when you get, when you see really big profit spikes, uh, it's a sign that there might be a bit of a retrace due to the amount of profit taking going on and sending the price back down uh, because there's more interest in temporary sell action than there is buy action. That's the theory behind that. Uh, and the last metric I want to touch on, dormant activity. So this is showing the average age in which coins have been sitting in their wallets. Uh, typically, when it's moving up, that's a sign of stagnancy on the network and coins getting older and older because they haven't been touched. They're just kind of collecting dust in their respective wallets. When it starts to move down, that's the opposite. That means that there's older coins that are suddenly moving back into circulation, which theoretically creates a healthier network and adds more coins back into the mix for people to do what they will with, You know, whether they're on exchanges or somewhere else. Uh, it's theoretically good that coins are are moving out of older wallets where they were just being held without any action happening because more utility equals higher uh, market caps over time so we've gone from an average age of about 639 days back on october 21st to 589 days those 
numbers are pretty arbitrary, but just understand that when this line is moving down, typically that is an indication and a justifier that we're in a bull cycle. So it's still moving down now. I would be shocked if it stops after we see these big milestones. Uh, but watch for the moment when it pretend, potentially flattens out and starts moving up again. That would be kind of that caution flag that we're stopping or at least temporary, temporarily halting the uh, bull cycle action that we've been in. But for now, all looks good on this one, which I really like to see. Nice. So overall, would you classify everything we shared as more bullish indicators, in your opinion, where you think we'll continue to climb? Or do you think we're more leaning towards a healthy pullback from here? Yeah, that's that's a great question. You know, we we obviously don't give an invest give investment advice, but we can say, you know, based on history, you know, these metrics are typically bullish. These are bearish. And it's kind of a mix right now. I'm seeing on the short term much more bearish signals than we have seen in a while. However, long term, such as this graph, which is one of our best, uh, you know, monthly or yearly charts to look at to show where prices are going to go next. This is still screaming that we're we're smack dab in the middle of a bull cycle, which I like to see. I think the ETF volume is a great indication that we've got more room to climb. Um, and and I think the rest kind of comes down to whale activity, which looks neutral right now. They're definitely not showing huge profit taking signs. I, I, I wish they were climbing a little bit more to keep up with the price. Uh, but whales and sharks kind of they've got their own agenda. And we were even talking um, internally about whether 60K could potentially be that target point for a lot of them where they wanted to. Uh, you know, collectively pushed prices up to that point. If it went a little bit beyond, no big deal. And then the, the big correction would begin. But hasn't happened yet. There, there hasn't been any sudden turnaround. Uh, and it got all the way up to 63.7. I'd be shocked if it doesn't try to reach that point once again and, and potentially move to 65. Um, but I, I guess to answer your question, short term, definitely some big concerns with average trading returns through the roof. Uh, mid and long term, I, I think there aren't any massive red flags right now. Nice. Uh, thank you. I'm pretty much in the same camp. Long term, extremely bullish. Uh, reiterating what I said earlier, I wouldn't be surprised if we smashed that six figure milestone uh, before the halving. I know it's now a real possibility. Um, price discovery is around the corner, whether we crack now short term, still extremely bullish uh, for the long term heading into the halving. And history shows us it's always the year preceding the halving. We hit the cycle peak. This is going to be the fourth halving. We had the 2012, 2016 and 2020. And we always peaked out the year preceding the halving as we did in 2013, 2017 and 2021. So if history is the rhyme, that should tell us that by fourth quarter of 2025, we can expect a cycle peak but who knows everything can change the cycle nobody knows but i think that's what makes it so exciting exactly yeah that's really well said i, I i'm a big believer in the cycles as well um obviously it's a small sample size when you're talking about four year cycles you know we're talking about 2012 2016 and 2020 that's about it i wouldn't count 2008 the year that pizzas were being bought for millions of bitcoin uh but we've had three previous instances to compare to what 2024 typically is. Uh, and they've all been some of the best among the best years of Bitcoin's price performance. So if if we continue to go along that pattern, life is going to be pretty good throughout this year. Uh, I guess to play devil's advocate, if everyone starts to believe, you know, this cycle means we're we're going to go up this year and down the next year. Uh, that pattern is going to be broken because of the zero sum game factor. Um, but I, I still don't think most people pay attention to that. That's that's my opinion. I think it's really the, the big long term holders and the analysts that that have those cycles in mind like you and I. Yeah, good point. I agree, man. It's going to be a very exciting 2024 and 2025. We deserve to be here, man. We survived the bear and we're still going strong. And uh, it's kind of like deja vu. You know, it's like, wow, I've been here before. But only this time we have the institutional adoption, which didn't exist 
in uh, 2021 when we peaked out at that 69,000 all time high on uh, what was it, November 10th. Also, we had FTX dumping vast amounts of Bitcoin right. on the exchanges, and some experts believe we could have surpassed 100,000 the previous cycle top, but there seemed to be an orchestrated agenda to suppress the Bitcoin price. And now those agendas are no longer working. Yeah, I believe Alameda and FTX kind of acknowledged that there was there was a bit of conspiracy to suppress prices for their own benefit. And as soon as FTX kind of got out of the way, uh, Bitcoin and crypto markets got back to where a lot of people thought they should have been in the first place. So great point there. Um, any other topics you want to bring up before we break? I'll just quote the legendary high priest of Bitcoin, Max Kaiser. He was just interviewed on Alex Jones's show uh, yesterday and uh, something he shared. The switch from gold to Bitcoin ETFs proved that gold is being demonetized by Bitcoin in real time. This sets up a legitimate target for Bitcoin to eclipse gold's market cap with an implied price target for Bitcoin of 780000 per coin. Hearing this prediction brings back deja vu moments of when I remember, it may have been in 2017, when the Winklevoss twins made the case for a $500,000 Bitcoin. And their big point in that uh, study they released was ultimately Bitcoin eclipsing the market cap of gold. I obviously believe that Bitcoin is superior in every way you can measure it. And uh, yeah, if we overtake the market cap of gold, uh, game on. There's nothing stopping from Bitcoin to soaring to potentially that seven figure price range, or at least 500,000 as the Winklevoss twins originally predicted. We have ARK Invest, Kathy Wood. She's raising her ante of her prediction now to 2.3 million, now that we have all these ETF inflows by the year 2030. So there's just so much to look forward to. Like I said earlier, I couldn't be more bullish right now, Brian. I love it. Yeah. Hearing those those wild price predictions and, and seeing us very, very slowly get closer to those price predictions uh, it's, it's just exciting to see. And, uh, as always, you know, we want to caution everyone that there, there will be bumps in the road on our way to those price, uh, values that some of these big names are, are calling for. Um, so remember that nothing in, in Bitcoin is linear. It's no straight path to, uh, the Lambos and whatever you, you may be dreaming of and, and try to be safe and not over leverage with your investments on the way to uh, what you're hoping to accomplish in the crypto markets. Stage advice, and I always like to remind people that Bitcoin is a long-term uh, appreciating asset. If you're gonna hodl for one to two cycles minimal, and you're in this for the long haul, stack as much sats as you can. If you're just in this for the short term, dip your toe in it, you may get wrecked. I mean, that's what a lot of people do. They come to crypto like Dave Portnoy with the paper hands and they get wrecked. Yep. So don't be one of those guys. Hodl for the long haul and recognize that Bitcoin's been on a 15 year bull run and it's not slowing down anytime soon. When in doubt, zoom out. When in doubt, zoom out. Well said. Uh, I think this was a great episode. I look forward to doing more with you and, and getting back in the swing of things and um, as we discussed before this call started, I, I'm going to try to appear on some of your podcasts down the road. Um, and I'll, of course, leave the link to Crypto News Alerts. Make sure to give him a follow, everybody. Uh, really great content coming out on uh, a very regular basis. So um, I want to thank you personally. I think this was a blast. What a great day to, to reconnect for some crypto talk. And uh, I'm wishing you the best. Heck yeah, right back at you, Brian. I appreciate it and appreciate what you guys are doing at Sansement. One love. Yes, sir. All right. Thanks for watching, everyone. We'll talk to you soon.